Claire, good morning. Good to see you this morning. How are you? Okay? <laughs> it's delightful to see you, Chris. <laughs> delightful to see you. Thank you. Um, so you've, I want to talk to you because you've obviously launched a new business looking at space and design, which we'll talk about. But the lovely thing about, particularly talk about you, is actually some of the, because you're not the, conven I think it's fair to say, you're not the conventional type that fits into any normal corporate structure. You probably have to do your own business. Uh, but you've been influenced by so many different influences. You grew up in Scotland, which we'll touch on. you half Spanish. You have a great, you have a great uh, influence coming from India. Um, which is actually really where how all this comes together. It actually makes you just who you are. So let's start with Scotland, because you grew up your first 12 years or so in Scotland, didn't you? I did. Yeah, I'm, yeah I was born in Scotland in the Highlands. My mother is Scottish. My father is Spanish. So, um, and, 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 that, and that was a scandal, wasn't it? When it happened. A little bit. Not that I'm that old, but I'm not that young. <laughs> With the so Highlands of Scotland. Sorry? I didn't say you were, you were old. I just said it was <laughs> Yeah, I know, but it was kind of the, the date comes into it. It was the 70s, and in those days, that in the Highlands, that probably a bit felt like it was a bit earlier. Um, yeah, and they still say, oh, Rosemary McIntyre, the one that got pregnant by the Spanish drummer. There we go. Can't put me in a box. <laughs> um, <laughs> to a beef farming family, the daughter. It was not the plan. Put it that way for my mother when she was sent to boarding school at nine. So she went to school in Edinburgh. But uh, yes, so, but I come from um, quite a strong matriarchal family. So my family are beef farmers and my, but my, my grandfather took ill when my granny was still quite young. So she took over the farm. Um, so she ran the farm, she ran the house. Uh, it's funny, I think you could look at it and think it's quite traditional, but with the traditional role models and, and as you could in Spain, but actually the women are kind of boss. Um, and my brother um, was actively encouraged to be a little prince, whereas I as a girl, under no circumstances was I to be the female equivalent. I just, as a, as a female, in, in certainly in my upbringing, you are capable of doing everything. That doesn't mean they're saying you must go and start a business. It's just not even discussed. You can just, you just must know how to do everything like my granny did. Um, but funnily enough, traditionally, she, she was from the 50s uh, in a time when actually this sounds really crazy now, but you, you didn't really educate women the same. I, I remember reading a book that said something, Barbara Kingsall, where she's, and it was something about educating women was um, in the 50s, was like pouring water into holy shoes. <laughs> in one of her books, she put this. And my grandmother had a master's, as did her sister. There were no boys. But still in those days, it was considered a better career move as a woman to marry well than to be a lawyer, for example. So uh, that, that's, yeah, so, so that's what my granny did. And actually in the end, she had to take her to farm. But you've been such an independent character your whole life, haven't you? I know you've got a young one, but you've, you've always been a very staunch, independent figure and character, haven't you? Yeah, but I think my granny was too, you know, and she traveled a lot. When I think about it, it was just all normal. I, she was very traditional. Um, certainly not bohemian. But she, she travelled a lot, but she had this eldest daughter who got pregnant by the Spanish drama. <laughs> so it was much more open-minded. So I've had very mixed influences. So I your father God. obviously comes from Spain. Yeah. Was he, I assume he was an apocryphal rock, rock group, was he? Yeah, it, my, it, it, my dad's story is fascinating, but I um, don't know what he was doing then. He's just young and handsome and on a stage. And my mum was the closest. <laughs> my dad is terrible. Um, but uh, so she used to help them translate all their lyrics into English in those days in Spain. But uh, no, my dad, it was fascinating. Dali said, this band will change the future of music for Spain. 
it's really fascinating when you hear, I don't know much about music. Apparently I have an ear for it, but I couldn't tell you, I haven't studied it or anything like that. Um, but it's fascinating when he tells you how you create an album. It's completely different. It was done overnight, just a very, very different scene. But yes, they, they, mum was went to go to university. She went to be an au pair briefly before uni, met my dad, took dad back to Spain and to Scotland and they went, uh, uh, stuck him back on a plane. And then mum went, oops. <laughs> you might want to do that. <laughs> I think Daddy was still unsure. But uh, yeah, so, so we lived in, we, I think we went back to Spain <laughs> for a while. <laughs> and then, ooh, post. And then we, um, we lived in Scotland. And then when I was 12, we moved to England. So most of my life. I've lived was in that, England. Was that, to, was that London or was that somewhere else in England? Oh no, it's now. <laughs> no, I've been in London for a long time, years, I, uh, yeah. gosh, over 20 years or something. But uh, no, we went to Southampton. Um, and <laughs> then, uh, and then five years ago, I went back to Spain, but I've lived in Spain. I went to university in Spain. I worked in Spain when I was younger, so I've been in Spain on and off. I think you've frozen. I did, I'm back again, you'll be glad to know. <laughs> Can you hear me okay? I'm fine. Yeah. Um, so, but where's India? Because India has been a big influence on you, hasn't it? Yeah, huge. South India. Yeah. I think I first, I first went in 2008, when I, um, I closed, I had a, a healthy takeaway in the city in London, and I closed momentarily, I was going to relocate. Um, and my friend was going to India with her boyfriend split up and then said, do you want to come? And it wasn't on my bucket list. Uh, I don't think I even liked Indian food that much then. Because, you know, kind of in those days, everybody just say Indian food food after they've been out drinking, which for me was just like... Oh, but Indian food's come a long way in the last time. Oh, it's incredible. And to be fair, in this country, it's not anything like what I have in India. You know, and also, no, no, you can't even see Indian food to go to India. You know, Kerala is a strip. It's completely different to go in food, which is hugely Portuguese influence. And actually, go in food is absolutely... I love go in food. And in the north, where they don't have the sea so much and they use more spices and they cure the meat, it's just, it's completely different if you go from one state to the next. But Kerala, where I spend a lot of time, is a lot of fish. I, I, and, and, um, but that's, where, I think you, that's also where you really got into architecture and design as well, isn't it? It really sparked your interest. Yeah, in. I think, I, th I mean, I've, I've, I've always loved it, but I don't know if other children were the same you know, moving their entire bedrooms around all the time. Um, and we'd always renovated houses. So it, for me, it was just normal. But then when I got to, and also when I did Root, I hired an architect because you hire an architect, but then I designed everything. And then even when it got to, to the details, I went, okay, hang on, let's let me do this. And he was a, a, a great guy and um, he managed the builders and stuff. It was a shell. And then when I got to India, I, we, on our list, of places we stayed in this hotel a boutique hotel that had just opened and is now really popular and um and i met the owner who's since become a dear dear friend uh he's from kerala from cochin and a very very smart man and i think i just closed roots so when i started talking to him i left the sun to chat to him <laughs> i left the swimming pool the granite swimming pool um, because it's just super interesting talking to him and we're very good friends so with him he introduced me to the Sri Lankan architect Jeffrey Bauer who's fascinating um, and he came from an old Ceylon family was meant to be an accountant or a lawyer um, and that's what he trained to be but just was absolutely drawn to design and architecture and then against his family's wishes later in life he studied architecture and he used to pair collaborate with with artists so actually through my my friend in india he took me to paradise rose Cafe, road cafe 
they've just put a piece on that guy, the owner's house. He's a beautiful designer, but that was originally Jeffrey Bauer's office. I went to Jeffrey Bauer's house. I've stayed in some of his hotels that he designed, but the design is just, it's very much the design I like, and he's a huge influence on a lot of architects and designers so what, nowadays. So, so what, what is it about his designs that makes such a difference? And so different? He's, he's absolutely about bringing the outside in, which obviously is a bit easier in Sri Lanka and kind of preferable in that heat. Um, but I like that. Even places in London, I like to have light. So, well, my London and Spain, I mean, for me, light is fundamental. And as much as you can get the outside in, um, I think we all need it, whether we realise it or not, you know, it, it's nature. Um, but he's also... His collaboration with artists is beautiful. He's quite simple in his design, which I like. Uh, he's not fussy, but I wouldn't say it's minimalist and it's not clinical. You can't copy him. Very talented. Um, he can do old spaces, new spaces. And I would say that he would set a trend. In fact, boutique hotels, uh, I, I, my understanding is he started these because he partnered with Donald Friend, who is an artist Australian, I think. And I think they started in, uh, in Bali. And then you see so many boutique hotels in Sri Lanka, and I'm sure that's down to Jeffrey Bauer. So yeah, so the architect that did the hotel in, in Cochin, and he's done quite a lot actually in Cochin, was influenced by Jeffrey Bauer. And again, super simple, understated luxury. You're very comfortable, but it's not, you know, it's fluffery and it's about taking stuff out so you can, I think, in, enjoy the space. And does it change the way you thought about things in terms of design? Maybe it made me understand it more. Um, I think I've done it instinctively. For me, design, cooking, it's all very instinctive. Um, but at the same time, I really like order. Um, so there's an awful lot of taking out so that you can see the space. I think that's psychology, though. I don't think we can necessarily, and certainly if you look at hospitality, I've done an awful lot in hospitality where I've taken out and people come and go, well, this is easy. I think, well, well, yeah, because our brains don't necessarily, I hate to say it, but buy in a jumble sale environment. Um, and you can absolutely do the farmer's market, you know, then suddenly farmer's markets came, became fashionable such a long time ago now, but they're ordered. They're thought through, that's not just thrown out. Your brain knows where to look, like in a painting, you're actually directed, your eyes are meant to go around a painting a certain way. That's absolutely the same with retail and, and farmer's markets when you have the piles of food. And if you do, I like less clutter, but when I do Spanish beach houses, you don't want it to look like a city house. So, gosh, this, this, this could go on forever if I went into this because you've also got to think about the humidity getting into the cupboards, but I still don't want everything out on the surfaces collecting sand and dust. So you have to think about the design, but you, you want it to feel relaxed and, and like a, a holiday house, but you still want, want the order. Um, and that's the same with hospitality. I actually feel that that's probably the same with most things. Well, I, well, I think it is. I think it's, it's the inspiration, isn't it? So I think everyone's learning at the moment. So I think design and space is becoming more important, particularly after COVID, when people have been shut away in spaces that haven't been designed for them to work. And actually everyone's beginning to think about space in a different way. And the same with, you know, workspaces where people are getting stressed and mentally fatigued. Now they're going to have to think about how do I, what is it that I can do in my space to make it more attractive, more user-friendly, nicer. And I think that's where you come into play, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I, I can't remember the statistic, but don't they say homewares since COVID have just boomed? Um, yeah. Like a 40% increase or something, because people are at home looking at spaces that previously they're at work. We spent most of our time at work. You come home, you sleep. And depending what age you are, you know, if you're with children, you're outside. And um, you're, you know, if you're not with children, you're going to restaurants and now I mean you can see it where I live in Clapham on, on Northcote Road the people that are the outside tables you think oh that's going to be full they're not people are coming for their takeaway coffee they're at home so I see it with friends they're doing up their houses and there's and, and on you see it with families they're going well where on earth do I work 
I'm having to hide in the bathroom. Or even friends, I mean, I don't know, I've always, I've often worked from home and I work quite well from home. I, I like working from home. I feel I'm, we're all different, but I feel I, I'm quite focused at home. Um, so I've always created spaces that can be a desk. If I'm in a smaller space, for example, in Clapham, it's not a huge house. So I have, I had a, a, a cabinet built, which is my bookcase, and you can just open some drawers and there's a little drawer, a little table that slides out and the sockets are behind because I don't want all the cables out. And actually doing design beach houses in Spain do the same thing because I think we all have a laptop pretty much nowadays, but I don't want the cables out. I want it to have its home. Everything can have its, its space. So, but I think that's something that people don't, haven't necessarily thought about before. You don't want your books all over the table and you're going to eat on it later. And I think there's a whole belief that maybe it's not so healthy to work and sleep in the same room. Well, that's the, that's the, I mean, that's one of the interesting things about you, isn't it? Because, I mean, even during COVID, it's trying to box you is almost impossible. So you've been, in, you've been in the Highlands for a period of time, you've been in Spain for a period of time, you've been in Clapham for a period of time. Um, but actually, everything about you is that kind well, of... Because I have a feral child. I have a, a feral little 20-month-old child. If I was on my own and they said, I'm sorry, uh, Claire, you can't leave your house in Spain, I go, hallelujah. I'm going to do yoga on that roof. I'm going to watch Netflix. I'm going to read books and sneak out for walks with the dogs. But no, no, this little monster was running around and I said, I cannot stay in a house, albeit with a roof terrace. It was very, very strict, the lockdown in Spain. Incredibly strict. You couldn't even take your dog more than 10 metres from the house. So I fled and left the dog and told her I'd be back in two weeks. So, um, I, bet yeah, the dog loved you. I bet the dog loved you. <laughs> She's a little bit traumatised now. She just yeah. won't. She just keeps thinking, I'm going to leave her. Every time we visit somebody, she thinks this is her new home. We came over. I had to go back and get her with Sebastian. So, um, and the car, which I'd left on the border with Gibraltar. There was a bit of a hysteria in Spain when it started, and it happened in 48 hours. And they really follow a rule in Spain. Um, so even before the lockdown, nobody was leaving the house. And no, you know, so, and said, the, no taxis, you couldn't... Um, so yeah, we went, we drove, we took a plane back, got the car, uh, packed up the, ha up the house, got the dog, drove through Spain. Um, but, it's, but it's also just you, isn't it? Because the, even, even if it hadn't been locked down, you do love a variety, don't you? And you do love different influences then. Because actually what makes you up is a whole variety of international influences coming together. Yeah, yes. Yes, I've always, I've, I've really enjoyed that. I've, um, I think Sebastian's father found it a little bit strange and he's Portuguese. So my son is, you know, Portuguese, Scottish, English, and he was born in, in London uh, and, and he's Spanish. Um, <laughs> he needs to learn so many languages. And at the moment he, he's, he's really proud of himself because he can say Bar Bar from Bar Bar Black Shoe. <laughs> Technically, that's not a word, but congratulations, let's encourage it. We have to repeatedly sing Baba Black Blacksheep so he can sing along with Baba. Um, I'm like, okay, this is worrying. But uh, yeah, it's, it's all, I really love the different influences, but I have to say with a child, it's slightly tricky because you kind of need to pick a country, I think. I'm not into that whole, let's travel around in a van thing. No, no um, I get that. But where's home for you then? Right now, oh gosh, I, honestly, I feel so at home in Spain. I feel at home in Scotland, but the daylight hours in winter make it tricky. Um, and I have a lot of family friends in Scotland. My, m most of my family, actually, to be honest, a lot of my Scottish family are in different parts of the globe. This is why the Scots did so much around the world. I think it was at, at dark at 3.30, let's go to another country. Um, and... <laughs> That just create countries elsewhere. Um, I'm, I, I, but also, you know, London, I feel very, very at home in London, but I have a lot of friends here. I've been here such a long time that I feel, um, you know, I've been in Clapham for 20 something years. 
So right now I'm absolutely, I'm, I'm loving being back in London, but you know, I do, yeah, I, I miss, miss Spain after some time, but it's, it's really nice being in, in your, in your country where things no, I get that. Well, and, you, and you've now set your own business up. What, do you, what are you hoping to do in business? What are you hoping to focus on? It's a very broad question. <laughs> well, hard question. Would you like to know how to do that? <laughs> well, look, you believe, let's rephrase it, you set up your own business, you're doing, helping on people's homes, you're helping on businesses, looking at space differently. You've got a young one. Um, so is it a business that you hope to grow to become, just to get people to think differently about space, particularly, and bring your own signature to that? Yes. I, the thing for me is I'm really, I, I really enjoy uh, design within hospitality and, and home spaces and villas. Um, I think actually I just enjoy the entire concept. I love concepts and seeing them all come together, be that a tiny little street market or um, a, a whole set of holiday apartments and seeing how, because it's all psychology and, and how people enjoy it at the end um, and being clever with design so that you can, gosh, that's maybe, maybe clever, but you know, thinking through design. So you don't, it's not about putting loads of expensive things in there. I designed so much stuff for houses in Spain. I've designed a lot of stuff because the Tarifa house, for example, and Tarifa is only nine kilometers, nine miles actually from Morocco. Um, so we've got a lot of in Moroccan influences there. So I got a lot of furniture made. I designed it and had it made in, in Morocco, which, it's great for the price and now it turns out it's super fashionable but you can actually be really clever with design and make it look high-end if you give it a bit of thought and I, I really like doing that thinking about space and how you maximize the light how you look at the environment you're in how you you have to be I'm not going to put a whole load of Italian stuff in a Spanish house for example or, or vice versa you have to be loyal to the environment you're in I think and I hate to say this word now because it feels like it's a hashtag but it has to be authentic you know um, so I really enjoy that looking at each environment and thinking right what would be the best thing for this environment and for the people that will come here what would they enjoy I mean it's interesting listening to you because you almost have this great fear of ever doing anything stereotypical or being a cliche you do need to be different don't you <laughs> Yeah, and somebody very successful <laughs> once said to me, um, he's created a very well-known brand, and he said to me once on holiday, Claire, the thing with you is you like to be niche and you're and ahead and you like the new idea. And actually, if you, you almost need to be more mainstream. But then I think, well, everybody can do it then. I don't need to do it. I don't need to think of something different. Um, I wouldn't say I do anything out there though. It's my design is absolutely timeless. I really, I don't like waste. No, you're actually like classical, don't you? You're actually quite classical. I'm classical, but not necessarily so traditional, but I, I really, I love mid-century design, certain mid-century design, especially Danish. And, and I think you can mix things like that. And I, I don't want to change the colors every year. I think that's really crazy and faddy stuff. That is just, it's just, a, I don't think it's a great idea to be throwing stuff away all the time. So if we can, but absolutely, you can set trends. There's designers that are absolutely brilliant at that. And Ilsa Crawford is another one. She's very good. And she did the Soho houses. She does an awful lot of stuff. She's done an awful lot for Ikea, that lampshade that everybody knows. Um, um, really, she's really beautiful designs. And she, I would say she's quite like that. Her design is uncliched. But I think it's really difficult because design is really, honestly, it, it is instinctive. You can't, I really, I like order and I actually think a lot of designers probably like order, you know, uh, that's how you do it. It's massively taking out to make something so that people can see what is there. Um, but Ilsa Crawford has got a, a really good ability of mixing traditional with contemporary, with value, with higher end. And you would look and think, gosh, that must be really expensive. But look, she's done this beautiful Ikea range that is great value. 
really simple lines. And this lampshade, and if I showed it to you, you would know. Um, it's been around for years, it's beautiful. And, and I think that's what design is, but you can absolutely swap in little bits that are, you know, at the moment people really love bamboo and things, but you can do that in a way that it is timeless and you're not changing it all the time. But unfortunately, the thing is, it's like food and design. They're very, very fashionable right now. And anything with fashion can become cliched, of course. We like a, a certain item and then it, it, it becomes very popular. Um, but that's why I would say there's certain elements you just, you put less of. I think actually with most things, less is more. Just don't do it. But that's the whole interesting thing for you, because we've, we've discussed this a lot of, um, during lockdown, as you've set the business up, is that bit about everything about you is instinctive, but it relies very much on all the various influences coming into from your life and how you see things against the more traditionally trained architect or interior designer, isn't it? Is that fair? But you bring a very different dimension because you are that kind of creative, empathetic person seeing things in a different way. Maybe you're right. I don't, I don't know. I just, I know that the spaces I create, I get very good feedback. To me, it's instinctive. I, I have trained people an awful lot in the past in implementing designs across a lot of restaurants and that seems to work well. I, apparently they have, this is not my words, found it inspiring. Um, and they've done, and, and it actually has been rolled out. So, so there are degrees that so in hospitality, you can roll this out, out a lot, across a lot of restaurants and the designs we've implemented still are still there. And even the design I did in a cafe in, in Brute in 2005 or something, I would still do that. I'd maybe change the lampshades. Um, so it, yeah, it, it's, but I, I don't know if I think so differently. I, I, cause I guess it's just, it's the way I think it's just a passion that I, I really enjoy it. Um, and I don't, an interesting one, a lot of the time I noticed when I was in hospitality, a challenge people felt like, oh, she does design, it's probably not practical. That I don't understand because then it's, it's not, that's just sloppy to me. What's the point of putting something out that's not practical? It can be practical and beautiful. It was Alvar Alto, he said, the 50s designer, and he said, design is the harmony of purpose and form. And that, that I, he, he's done some incredible stuff that we still use and actually Ikea have copied and probably Habitat. And I agree with that. I mean, the, the, I mean, the reality, I think there's lots of offices around London who will say, look, they've probably got a design wrong. The fact that so many people have struggled to find good working spaces or finding really productive working spaces says that actually a lot of designs haven't been good enough. And actually there's a need for a new way of thinking, isn't there? But I think we've often focused, I guess it depends completely on the environment you're in because you could go to co-working spaces and they would say, well, yeah, absolutely. You know, no, we've, we've made it like our home, but practical, you know, for working. And I don't know, I've, I've always found it strange that why does a business environment have to be business colors? or look like a business environment. Why? Why can't it be an environment that we would relax in, that we'd chat with our friends in, that we'd eat in? Even when I, I did restaurants so long ago, I remember people looked at me like I'd just grown horns when I said, well, I want my cafe to look really nice and I, I, I want everyone to be different, but you'll still know its roots. Because in those days, prep was really functional and pretty much prep was all there was. And, you think, and they've softened a lot since then. And Byron opened and actually then they, everyone looks different, but we still know it's a Byron. Why should, why? It was, we've thought, okay, so maybe you're right. For me, this is all natural, but it was, you know, we went through a revolution in food and maybe you're right, that's happening with design. I think if you're in Italy and you work in an office, of course it's got to look nice. It's an office, but it's still got to look nice, you know. And I, I you know, they're, 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 the Italians they're, think differently, don't they, about the fashion, do. don't they? And they think differently about hospitality. Yeah. They do, right. But even their branding years ago, Illy Coffee, they used to do these beautiful uh, adverts. And I was just like, well, but why wouldn't it be both? There's no, there doesn't need to be a compromise either way. It's just, it's again, it's psychology. We, the messaging, certainly if you're doing a restaurant, the design of the space creates a message about the food you're going to eat. People are coming what? to cafes. 
I mean, there's a number of points, isn't there? Number one, people love classical beauty. I mean, people, that's why the Italian designs often get so much thing, because actually they're very, often very classical, aren't they? But very beautiful and you, you know, very glamorous and elegant. They're timeless. They're timeless. Yeah, timeless is a better word. But a yeah. lot of offices either are functional, very, very functional, and therefore lack atmosphere, or they almost go to the other extreme where they get overly trendy, which also doesn't work because it makes people feel uncomfortable. And it's cliched and then you yeah. have to swap it all out and it's fabby. Yeah. But I think even Germany, you know, they're very functional. They like things practical, but they look at design. You know, so one of my favorite shoe designers, they're really comfortable shoes and they're really nice style. And a lot of, I, used, I worked in fashion before and those people in fashion go, oh, those are nice. And they're German, super practical and they look really good, you know, but they would be quite minimalist and, and the whole, the Scandinavian look. But I don't mean minimalist and clinical. There's no need for things to be clinical. It's just, um, I think, I think look, honestly, I think, I think now oh. people are really opening their minds to design because you know, actually they do want to find that balance that works for them, both at home and in the office. So I think it's going to be an interesting time for you. Well, yeah, yeah, I hope so. I think, yeah, yeah, I'm sure you're right. Um, no, no, it's going to be an interesting to build the business. So I'm, I do wish you well and I thank you for your time today. I think it's been a delight talking to you. It always is. It's always good fun talking to you anyway. Always a delight talking to you, Chris. <laughs> and, I I know how much you, and I know how much you love these sessions. So thank you. <laughs> I thoroughly enjoyed them. <laughs>